grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, and our Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, Happy New Year. Welcome to 2023, and and what a wonderful way to start the new year with a baptism. Isn't that great? Well, with the new year comes New Year's resolutions. How many of you have made your New Year's resolutions? No? Nope, not any. (laughs) Oh, that's what I figured. There are lots of people who take this idea of New Year's resolutions and think, New year, new you. That now that the calendar has turned into the new year, you can be a whole new person. You can make yourself better. Yes, we stand in front of the mirror and we reflect upon ourselves and say, I need to do better than that this year. Well, I looked online to see what the top New Year's resolutions were. The top New Year's resolutions, starting with five, First off is to spend time with family. Now I think now that we're in the tail end of the pandemic and we're out and about more, we look back on those years when we were in isolation and we realize we enjoyed spending time with our family. And and so as we look ahead to the new year, we think maybe we should go back to that a little bit more. Along those same lines, number four is to save money. As you are out and about and shopping and doing different things, you realize, well, maybe we should hang on to that a little bit more. So that's the number four resolution. Now you can probably expect number three. As you stand in the mirror and reflect upon yourself, you might notice that your clothes are getting a little tighter. And so number three is to lose weight. Lose weight in the new year. Well, there's two great ways to lose weight, and those are our top two resolutions. Eat healthy and exercise. And if you are like Pastor Zier, you could join my walking running group to fulfill that resolution in the new year. (laughs) As we talk about New Year's resolutions, I think that we often have one of three different approaches to resolutions. I think some people take a middle-of-the-road approach, and they say that they want to keep it attainable. Let's not try to do all five of those. Let's pick one, maybe the easiest one, or maybe something easier than any of those five. Because by the end of the year, we want to feel like we have achieved something. So let's keep it attainable. Let's go right down the middle of the road. Now, some people go the other extreme, and they are all in. New year, new me, I'm going to redo myself in the new year. Five resolutions? That's not enough. (laughs) Let's go for more than that. They go all in on trying to redefine themselves in this new year. But I think most people, probably most of you here, are in the last camp who resolve not to resolve. (laughs) Now, there there may be just a little bit of pride in there to say, I don't need to change anything in this new year. But I would guess for most of you, it's not that. It's that you have tried to make resolutions in the past, and they haven't gone so well. And so as you look at making a resolution in this new year, you think, why bother to resolve if it's just going to end in failure? And so you resolve not to resolve anything in the new year. I think that our attitudes towards New Year's resolutions are very similar to our attitude towards God's law. Now, you know, as good Lutherans, we try to properly distinguish God's law from his gospel. His law is what he expects of you and me. And his gospel is what he has done for you and me in Christ Jesus. So as we think about God's law, Let's go back to confirmation class. For some of you, that might be a few years. For some of you, you might be in it right now. Now, how many of you remember the three uses of God's law? (laughs) I see a couple of hands. What's the first use of God's law? God's law is a curb. It's a curb that keeps us on the right path. It keeps us from going astray. God has given us his law so that evil doesn't run wild. 
In fact, he has written his law on our hearts so that even non-believers know God's law. They know that it's wrong to murder and to steal and to commit adultery. They know it by their nature because God has written his law on their hearts. He keeps evil in check. That's the first use of the law. I'm going to jump to the third use of the law. The third use of the law is as a guide. Our creator has given us a guide in his law on how to live as his creation in this world. His law tells us what to do and tells us what not to do. It is a guide for living in this world. Well, that's the first and third use of his law, and we typically don't have many problems with that. It's good to keep evil in check, and it's good to know how to live in this world. So when we get to that second use of the law that it starts to rub us the wrong way. You see, that second use of God's law is as a mirror. God's law shows us our sins. As we reflect on ourselves and our lives in comparison to God's law, we realize just how far short we fall, how we never achieve what God has expected us to do. Now, I think that our our expectations and our feelings, our attitudes towards New Year's resolutions are the same way that we feel towards God's law. You see, sometimes we are down the middle of the road. We try to keep it attainable. We try to follow God's law you know, at the face value of the Ten Commandments. We don't murder. We don't steal. We don't commit adultery. We are doing what we can do so that we can look back and say, that's enough. But we know that God's law goes more than just our actions. It goes to our hearts. Now, some people are all in on God's law. God's law makes me a new me, a good and perfect person. And so they try to follow all of God's laws and try to get other people to follow it too. So that at the point you become more focused on God's law than his gospel. I think what's really dangerous is that last one, that I resolve not to resolve attitude. We know how sinful we are. God's law is a mirror and shows us that. And so as we think about following God's law, we reflect back on how many times we've failed, and we decide to try to avoid God's law altogether because it makes us feel bad about how we are as sinful human beings. I think those are our attitudes towards God's law. And the last one is the most dangerous. Well, that brings us to our gospel lesson for today, right? As Pastor Dave said, it's the shortest gospel lesson in the lectionary. And I'll read it again for you. At the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Now, you might be thinking, what does Jesus' circumcision have to do with New Year's resolutions or God's law? Well, circumcision was a very important part of God's law. And the fact that Jesus was circumcised is particularly significant for you and me. You see, circumcision was a sign of God's Old Testament promise. When God chose Abraham out of all the people of the world, and said, I am going to give you a family. and Your family will be my people, and I will be your God. That was his covenant. That was his promise with Abraham, that he would be their God, and they would be his chosen people. And he gave them a sign of that covenant, which was circumcision. This cutting of the foreskin, this shedding of blood, was a sign that these people would be different than the rest of the people in the world. He was setting them apart for his purpose. And he commanded that all newborn male sons be circumcised on the eighth day after they were born. Well, today is New Year's Day. It's the eighth day after Christmas. The eighth day after we celebrate Jesus' birth. And so that's why we talk about circumcision today. You see, Jesus following God's law is a bit surprising because Jesus was perfect. He wasn't under God's law. He created the law. Yet he humbled himself to be born of a man, 
to be born a virgin, to become man, God in the flesh. So why would he follow God's law? See, God knew that you and I could not follow his law perfectly. That's why he sent Jesus, to follow the law perfectly in our place, to do what you and I could not do. He took his perfection, his righteousness, and exchanged it for your sinfulness and mine. Now, some will call this the great exchange, the exchange of Jesus' righteousness for our failures. And what a great exchange that is for you and me. You see, he takes on our sinfulness, and we receive his righteousness. Jesus takes on our punishment, and we receive salvation. Jesus receives death, and we receive life. Jesus did what you and I could not do, because Jesus can do what death and sin could not stop. Jesus suffered and died on the cross with our sins on his shoulder, and yet he rose again three days later to new life, and he shares that new life with you and me. That is the great exchange, the exchange of Jesus' righteousness for our sinfulness. Now, before I go too much farther, I do want to make sure that we don't un- misunderstand something. We can think about this great exchange and think about God's law and think that that was his plan for salvation, that we follow his law to be saved. But we failed at following his law, and so he had to send Jesus to do what we can do, almost as a backup plan. But Jesus is no backup plan. Jesus was God's plan from the very beginning. And if Jesus was God's plan for salvation, what was the law? Well, St. Paul says the law was our guardian until Jesus came. The law kept us in our place. It kept us from becoming too evil. It shows us how to live. But most importantly, God's law showed us our need for a Savior, a Savior who would be Jesus Christ. Jesus was always God's plan for the very beginning. Jesus was God's plan for our salvation from the very start. So Jesus came to fulfill the law. And in fulfilling the law, he fulfilled that first covenant You see, the covenant with the sign of circumcision, that circumcision was how people entered into that promise of God to be his people with that shedding of blood. Jesus' death on the cross, his shedding of his blood for you and me, was the fulfillment of that that first covenant, a fulfillment once and for all. And I love that phrase, once and for all. Jesus shed his blood once for all people, for all sins, for all time. Yes, Jesus fulfilled that covenant. He followed the law and he took our place and he started a new covenant. A new covenant where people would enter in not by giving their blood, but by having the waters of holy baptism poured out onto them where God pours his Holy Spirit into us so that we might have faith to trust in his promises, to trust in his gospel. You see, in our baptism, we are joined to Christ's crucifixion and we receive his righteousness. In your baptism, you are joined to his resurrection and you receive eternal life forever. Your sins are forgiven, and you are given the righteousness of Christ. Because he puts his name on you, and he makes you his child. You are a child of God. In your baptism, Jesus made you a new you, a righteous and holy you. He gave you a new identity as a child of God. And what a wonderful thing that is. So as a child of God, knowing that God in Christ Jesus has fulfilled his law, where does that leave us with the law today? Does that mean that it no longer has any application in our lives? 
Well, no. <laughs> Jesus said he came to fulfill the law, not to abolish it. But we are no longer bound to the law because we are joined to Christ in our baptism. And so the law serves a different purpose now. Have you ever heard of the concept of family rules? They're pretty much what they sound like. They're rules for a specific family. Now, lots of families have unwritten rules, but some rules in families are, are written down. People put them on their wall and plaques. You can even buy them. This is one I found on Pinterest. It says, in our family, we speak with gentleness and kindness. We obey with joyful hearts. We show love and respect for others. We love the Lord our God with all our hearts. Those are good family rules. Those are good rules for living in this world. And this family doesn't follow these rules out of obligation, but they follow them with joy. They don't follow these rules to become part of the family. They follow these rules because they are part of the family. And that's how it is with God's law today. We don't follow his law so that we can become part of his family. No, he made us his family in the waters of baptism. And because you and I are children of God, because we are in his family, we follow his law out of joy because it is good for us. It is good to keep us from evil, to show us how to live, and most importantly, to show us our need for a Savior, Jesus Christ. So in this new year, go ahead and make some resolutions. It's okay. You can do that and, and do them with joy. But might I make a few suggestions for your resolutions this year? As a child of God, as a member of his family, resolve to be in his word every single day. Read the Bible. Hear what your heavenly father has to say to you, his dear child. As a child of God, resolve to be in prayer every day. Speak to your Father. He wants to hear and answer your prayers. And if you are married, if you have kids, do it together as a family. Pray to the Lord as a family. As a child of God, resolve to be in worship every week, just like you are here this weekend with your perfect 2023 attendance. Keep that up the rest of the year. Because our worship times are family gatherings, a gathering of the family of God, where we join in fellowship, where we have a meal together in the Lord's Supper, where we hear his word and receive his forgiveness. You see, this year can be a new year and a new you. But don't try to find the new you in your resolution, and don't even try to find it in God's law. You are a new you because you have been baptized into the family of God. You are a new you because you are a child of God. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.